This is a continuation of the uh, financial seismology presentation. This is part two. We're going to focus on uh, our contention that multi-agent systems self-organize to critical points that are far from equilibrium. And in order to, to show that, I'm going to go to the next slide. Extreme positive feedback. That's what ends up causing uh, critical failure in materials. And these two pictures that are shown here, they're not live, but um, the picture on the left is a what they call a sand pile model, where the grain of sand is falling into this uh, matrix. And when each square gets up to, when a square gets up to four grains of sand, uh, it, it then has a... Uh, cascade an avalanche which then loads up the surrounding squares and then they have an avalanche when they reach four and so on. On the right you see a fellow with a shovel who's about to put his shovel into this wall of, of dirt and it is sort of the last um, that that wall is at a critical point at this moment and his putting the shovel in will cascade all the dirt down and cover his his uh, his car. Um, we see this kind of uh, these kind of critical points uh, at avalanches, earthquakes, and our contention financial market bubbles and busts are also uh, critical points. So how do we get there? Let's let's take a look. So, um, uh, being a scientist or a physicist, we we tend to create these potential energy models. Uh, it's it's nothing nothing really fancy, but we're we're identifying four states of the market. The first would be uh, state A, which is where the market is uh, uh, in contention between supply and demand. It, uh, supply and demand, supply wants to dump the security and demand wants to buy at state A. So there's a lot of potential energy for movement of price, but the price hasn't, hasn't uh, left the, you know, it hasn't moved yet. But there's a lot of energy re ready to go. When it finally does break, and then A would be a critical point, when it finally does break, it can go either running up in price very quickly or running down in price. And that's point B, where you're transiting to a, a very trend persistent environment. Uh, C would be the place where it's at value. Uh, okay, it's, it's um, the, the, new, the new stable point uh, where it will just rock back and forth and be at a, at a very low energy level. Um, and stable would be point C and point D is the the point at which you overshoot that the, the crowd is so excited that they push way past the equilibrium level and and get to another critical point which is an exhaustion of the of the move so the tendency is then for point D uh, to um, be the end of the trend and then the market will will fall back and oscillate around point C. So it's a simple, a simple model, but um, and we want you to sort of think about this as the um, as the model. Well, how do you get to point A? From point C would be your next question, and that that happens like this. Imagine you are at point C, where you're at equilibrium. This is a, a negative feedback environment where you can rock back and forth in price, a little bit up, a little bit down, but it's very symmetric. Well, then investor stress starts to accumulate. You get you know, people having their opinions about the stock. Maybe some news comes out. Maybe some fundamental uh, information comes out. Um, maybe macro uh, environment is, is changing. And the stress builds up. So the arrow here shows that the stress is building up. And point C is, is moving upwards. And eventually, point C becomes point A. <clears throat> and you get um, to an unstable point. Some people want to buy, some people want to sell now um, because of the, the stress that's accumulated. We call this uh, symmetry breaking because here in, in the first diagram you, you have a very symmetric uh, case and then by the time you get to point A here uh, you have an unstable equilibrium. So that's the that's the science of it. <clears throat> On the diagram you know, this first band that we introduced before, uh, you get a case where here's point D, where the market sold off too far, 
and it reaches a critical point and it has to roll back to point C which is our equilibrium area. Remember the point C between this red and the green line here is the um, area where you have mean reversion. So you're rocking back and forth uh, around this blue line which is your um, uh, stable equilibrium where the Hurst levels are extremely low and you have mean reversion. So what we've discovered is that over time <clears throat> you go from an excited state to a relaxed state um, and that's that also acts as a sort of a price target so if you get to this point D and we, we throw a signal when you get there we call it an extension then the tendency over time is to rock back to point C and we have another way of showing that this this these Hurst bands if, if we set up a little coordinate system where the bottom band is at zero and the top bands at 100 these are our uh, extreme um, Hurst levels. <clears throat> the middle level at 50 is where you've got mean reversion. So this is the mean reversion area. And up above and below are the trend persistent zones uh, reaching extremes. So if you use this little coordinate system, we can, we can ask, well, what happens after the market gets extremely extended? And what happens is at tops, this, this coordinate, you can't see it very well, but this coordinate on average is over thousands of, of samples. The, um, in the time it took to build that signal, which is this period here, and we'll get into, I'll show you what that, what that signal looks like, but the time it took to build this extreme um, oversold uh, case, e extreme extension bottom, the time it took to build it, if we look at what happens next in terms of our of our of our Hurst bands, um, what I was saying before is you should move from an extreme uh, low or an extreme high back to the middle. Well, that's exactly what this shows. For the bottoms, uh, bottom extensions, they move back up to uh, the midline, the the blue equilibrium line. Over the time it took this bottom um, uh, axis here is the time it took. 100% of the time it took to build the signal. So in the time it took to build this this uh, extreme event, in that amount of time it runs back to equilibrium. That's where the market wants to go. When it gets perturbed and it gets excited, it can't stay that way. It tends to want to come back and, and be at rest again, be in an equilibrium state. So why does this happen? Um, what What is the... and how do we define... Uh, this this behavior uh, and just to be I wanted to back up and talk a little bit more about um, fractals and, and the Hurst exponent. Hurst exponent is just 2 minus the fractal dimension so it's a very simple modification to fractal dimension. If you've had any introduction to fractals um, certainly uh, we, we all know that the dimensions uh, we learned this in, in grade school, you know, one dimension, two dimensions, three dimensions, very easily defined. We call these integer dimensions. They're whole numbers of dimensions. A fractal is a fractional dimension. It means, well, what happens if it's not perfect straight line, maybe it's a zigzag, um, slight, slight zigzag, has some, some bend in it. Well, then it, it can be represented by a number that has a decimal point. We call those real numbers. They have decimals. A uh, very high dimension would be a zigzag that, that fills a space. Um, it would be almost a two-dimensional object, but not quite. And you can see this in, in uh, patterns at even higher dimensions of something that uh, has a frac fractal structure. And the <clears throat> typical fractals, when you, you blow them up and, and um, change the scale and zoom in, uh, they look the same on all different scales. So that's... That's sort of, uh, that's what we call scale invariance. So scale invariance means that if you change the scale, you still see the same, uh, the same uh, roughness of the surface. So if you blew this zigzag up, it would also look like a zigzag. Well, it turns out there's another class of fractals um, and fractal dimension designations using complex numbers. And this is a relatively new idea. Um, and we see it in uh, crystal growth where you have a real and imaginary part to the dimension. Uh, if you remember back in um, algebra, you learned the square root of negative 1 was a, a complex number. Uh, well, complex numbers have two parts, a real part and what they call an imaginary part. 
and both parts are important to the description. Now in fractals, the imaginary part uh, creates a uh, situation where you do not have perfect scale invariance. You have what's called discrete scale invariance. And you get something called log periodicity, which we'll go through in a minute. But there are cases in nature with complex dimensions, and it turns out our markets are one of those structures. So in markets, this, uh, the, the form of the answer that we seek for critical points has two components, a real and imaginary part. And the real part um, is expressed as an acceleration in the case of going to an exhaustion. And in the case of the imaginary part of the solution, the imaginary part creates this ripple, which we call a log periodic ripple. In other words, if you plotted this ripple on a uh, you know, a piece of log paper, it would look like a sine wave. It would look like a perfect uh, cycle, uh, even cycle. But in a, in a regular time plot, it looks like it's converging. The, the uh, highs and lows are getting closer and closer together. And that actually acts as sort of a countdown clock. As these cycles get closer and closer together, we get closer and closer to the critical point. And that turns out to be the key. Uh, we can detect when we get to an extreme level of Hurst or an extreme, like a um, you know, high Hurst number or extreme low Hurst number. But the countdown clock tells you that you really have arrived. And that makes all the difference. So on the, uh, at, the, at the other end, extreme low values of Hurst, uh, we call those compressions. And again, you, the imaginary part of the fractal gives you this log periodic cycle which converges exactly at the point of the compression. And that's where the tug of war reaches that critical moment uh, where it one side or the other uh, gains, gains uh, the lead and, and takes off either to the downside or the upside. So these log periodic ripples lead into and out of these critical points. And notice the log periodic ripple ex it also survives the critical point and uh, it causes an expansion on the other side. So we should see highs and lows in price getting further and further away. I call these aftershocks. And you know, we're starting to get into the reason I, I call this uh, seismology uh, exercise. Uh, we'll, we'll see more of that in a minute. So what, it, what does that mean in markets, uh, in market terms? So uh, down below here, I've got a plot of, uh, this is Home Depot on a weekly scale, I don't know when, back in, back in time, 97 it looks like, 98, 99. Um, down at the bottom I've got uh, a band limited version, uh, I've got the Hearst exponent color coded at different scale levels. So I'm not doing one Hearst exponent for all scales as, as the traditional Hearsts are done, but instead I'm calculating it over a very small scale and then uh, moving that scale up. So at the bottom of these columns, I'm looking at maybe five bars of data to figure out an estimate for a Hearst. And at the top, I'm looking at maybe 250 bars of data. So I'm, I'm going from small scales to large scales. And the color coding is such that the blue represents mean reversion, white represents random, a random movement, uh, green means trend persistent upwards, and red means trend persistence downwards. So what's interesting about this graph is if this were a perfect fractal, if the market were a perfect fractal, the colors on all these columns at all scales would be the same. There'd be one Hearst number that describes all of it. They are not. An uptrend in, uh, say, on a you know, a five minute scale, you might have a trend persistent upwards um, motion, but maybe if you look at a weekly scale, you see a, a mean reversion. The markets do not have the same um, roughness on all scales at the same time. It just, it, it doesn't happen that way, except once in a while. And when these column, when this column is all the same color, you have um, a, a case where you have what they call discrete scale invariance. And that's the point at which the market reaches a critical point. Why is that? Well, if you have, it, like the green column here, if everybody is detected on all scales that the market is going up, it's trend persistent upwards, 
on all scales, what have they done? They've all bought. Everybody's been everybody's long right here. When everybody's long, what happens? Everybody's on one side of the trade, there's nobody on the other. Markets become unstable. That's what this marker is up here. It's telling you that the market has become unstable. It's at a high and it's likely to go sideways or retrace. And uh, same here, this one where all of them are green, you get a nice high point which then falls back. And I've labeled it with the A, B, C's and D's we talked about before. So these extremal points are D's and then it rolls back to C. Again, D back to C. And, um, and then works its way back to uh, unstable equilibrium and then you know, the, the, I didn't mark it here, but this column is roughly all all blue, or almost all blue, and it has a um, tug of war between supply and demand. Uh, supply wins, it dumps, and it goes right back to uh, a stable area. This is the value. These are the valuations, by the way. So you can see the bubbling and busting is happening all the time. Market goes above value, and then eventually comes back to it, goes above it, comes back to it above it comes back to me. Sometimes it just spends the time going below it. Okay, so what does it look like in real life? Um, there's the theory for an extension, which is a, uh, people have called these exhaustion moves. Um, this is the end of a trend, the beginning of a sideways or retracement. We don't know how strong the retracement will be. Uh, so I like to think of these as dead money periods. And they last for about, if this is the amount of time it took to build the signal right here, the amount of time that this uh, signal has an effect is about a third. The maximum effect is about a third of this, we call this the build time. Um, so it can, you know, obviously if this is a, a number of years, this can be, have a big impact. On a compression, the theory looks like this and the actual looks like this. You have a log periodic cycle that converges to a point. Uh, this is extremely high Hearst levels, tug of war, and one side wins. In this case the buyers win. The average paths are shown here. They kind of looks like a little scorpion, but we want to see the uh, uh, price movement away from the compression signal. Now log periodic cycles the, the throwback to, to um, you know, classical technical analysis is that many, many uh, <coughs> practitioners use Fibonacci numbers. Well, you take the log of Fibonacci series, it's you know, nice and even distances between each, uh, each number. That means it's a log periodic series, except for the first couple of, uh, of numbers. So, Lo and behold, it's a, it's a log periodic series. The GAN series, uh, which is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, uh, is also log periodic. So some of these uh, series that, that people called magical or mystical in the past uh, are, are really just log periodic series that they observed going into and out of critical points. And I mentioned that that these log periodic cycles are converging to the critical point. These are the critical point, the extension bottoms. These are the compressions where the, where the supply and demand is in contention. But this, this particular critical point, the build time was, was from here down to the, the critical uh, end of trend. But these little arrows mark the cycle tops and bottoms that are flipped to the other side. So as, as these get closer and closer together, these highs and lows get further and further apart. And if, if we've measured the phase of, this, of these cycles properly when we get here, uh, they may tell us when, when in time the next high or low is due to occur. Here's a low, you know, here's a high point that was expected this, uh, at this time, a low point that was expected at this time. We don't know what the price is, but we know the timing on the low. High point that's expected, a low point that's expected, and eventually this, this wears off, uh, obviously. So this is very important, and uh, we've measured what the statistical edge is on these extensions, the top and bottom extension. So we looked at 4,000 signals for the top extensions, 5,000 for the bottom extensions over a five-year period, 
and the edge is about 25-26%. Meaning, you have a, when you get a top extension, um, you have a 26 uh, well, plus 50, a 76% a chance of moving uh, below that extension, of, of being below that extension for a period of about a third of the build time. The, the predictive edge declines with time. This is the build time from 0 to 100% of the build time. And, and yeah, the, the predictive edge starts out high uh, or, or, you know, for a short or for a long and eventually wears off. And this is a longer study done from 1991 to 2022. And I, I will mention that um, uh, Morgan Stanley has certified Extreme Hearse for their advisor network. Uh, based on the statistical studies of, of, that we've done and they've done. So why is it important to seismologists? Well, it turns out when back in the 70s when we were looking at what might lead up to earthquakes, we were looking at the occurrence of um, uh, small quakes and then quiet periods and then clusters of small quakes and then quiet periods and uh, then a main shock and it never occurred to us to uh, add up the strain and, and, and draw a curve through these points that was log periodic. And now we're looking at a new set of eyes going, wait, there's, there's a log periodic buildup and strain uh, prior to a major earthquake. Uh, this was the Loma Prieta earthquake in San Francisco. It's where the, the Bay Bridge lost a lost a uh, piece of road and uh, there's a lot of destruction so but the build time you look at the build time that's 70 years of build time for a magnitude 7.1 earthquake so uh, this is a you know maybe a very important observation for seismologists that's part of the reason why I call this financial seismology because I believe this is now an important feature uh, leading into uh, an earthquake and this will be our next section, uh, but I'll end here and, um, and take any questions you have.